Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Hey guys, uh, back again. Can't stop now, I'm like the Energizer Bunny. Um, slightly different lighting arrangement. Uh, believe it or not, I uh, almost went, well, actually, I had to go to Home Depot for uh, some household, a couple of household items, and when I was there, I was looking at uh, regular kind of mini lamps that they have um, to, to kind of solve my lighting dilemma, and uh, none of them were very cheap, and you know, I don't have any money, so um, when I was there, though, I remembered, wait a minute, I do have a small portable desk lamp. That was actually my kitchen that I don't, you know, I use on occasion, but very rarely. So I brought that in here so I no longer, and I'd, I'd move it, but it's up on the shelf and it's, unfortunately, there's only one setting for it. It's very bright. So I had to actually point it away to me, from me, so you can actually see better lit what's behind me because the bulb is so bright and there's no alternate setting on there um, that I had to kind of face it away from me. So you could kind of see the ghastly shadows now on my walls of my garage. Um, but I think it's a better, it's a slightly better lighting solution than the emergency light where I was killing the battery on that. And sure enough, the electric went out today because we had uh, some heavy wind, but it only went out for, for a couple of minutes. Um, so what, I, what I've done before is, is talk about seasonal records. Now, I, I don't actually end up coming up on here four times a year to do it. Um, but like a lot of hardcore music fans, uh, I think we have various associations with certain types of music as well as specific albums. But more specifically, certain types of music, I think, that seem to run in cycles. Um, and I, I noticed this years, years ago when the uh, kind of late autumn winter time kind of comes uh, there's certain albums that I always get in the mood to hear and that certain types of music as well um, and I have this seasonal association uh, I'll give you a for instance uh, in the in the real dead of winter when you're like January February when it's really cold here you know snows on the ground it's very quiet outside because people tend not to go outside to socialize or anything so it gets very still um, I'm very much in an electronic electron, electronic mode um, specifically very specifically non rhythmic electronic music and it's not because I think of electronic music as cold, it's just um, to me that synthesizer music best conveys this kind of stillness of winter. And um, and it's not a contrived thing, it's not like me saying, oh the warm weather's coming, let me pull out these albums and listen to them, or the cold weather's coming. It's really very organic, it's really weird, it's, it's a cycle, it's an annual cycle. And um, you know, now that the weather's starting to, to warm up here, you know, um, I, I find myself desiring to hear certain types of music. And the spring and the summertime, to me, um, uh, I associate, and I always get in the mood to hear more acoustically based music. And and and. Um, you know, in the jazz world specifically, and in the classical world. Um, and the, the one non-classical album that I'm going to show that almost kind of fits in a classical category, that it's the only ECM album I'm going to show here, guys, the only non-classical uh, album I'm going to show. But to me, this is a real kind of, uh, we're not even quite there yet, but this is a real summer album. Uh, Art Landy and Jan Garbrick's Red Lanta, an album recorded in 1973, uh, Art Landy playing just acoustic piano, and Jan Garbrick playing um, soprano and bass saxophones, but specifically flute. And there's probably more flute playing on here uh, from Garbrick. Well, I love his flute playing much more so than his saxophone playing even. Um, and it's, he, there's a lot of flute playing um, 
specifically the standard metal flute on this one. Later on, he got into more ethnic wood flutes and things like that, uh, which I love his playing. He doesn't seem to play them at all anymore. Um, now, all this, this was recorded in November of 73, so this is an old album. This is a classic. This is definitely a classic. And I remember seeing a uh, concert by the, East, the brief ECM band gallery, and I got to speak to Paul McCandless. Uh, I don't know how we got on this topic of this particular album. Um, he said that... Um, he corrected me on how to pronounce, I thought it was Artland, Silent E, but it's Artlandy with the E. He corrected me on that. I don't know how he got to start on this album, but he said, you know, this was a very influential album to a lot of musicians. And I could see, I could see the whole, the whole Wyndham Hill, um, the non-guitar albums, you know, the, the piano albums that came out of the, uh, the Wyndham Hill thing in the early 80s. Uh, really, I could see the real connection to this. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful album. This is an easy one to get into. There's no avant-garde stuff here. Uh, nothing dark or, or difficult. It's actually very pretty at times, but with substance. And it's one of those albums that I associate with summertime. So we're not quite there yet, but I have been thinking about that, and it kind of fits the theme of the video here. Um, and for some reason, I don't know why I, I associate the, the uh, classical, the, the metal flute, so much with summertime. But whenever I hear, especially like solo flute or flute playing uh, as lead instrument in an orchestra, or like in this case, uh, with piano, I always think of summer lawns. You know, I, I, I picture this one um, county park that I used to go to as a kid. And then I, when I first got my license, I used to like driving through there, as small as it is. Um, and I always picture the, the lawn, the grassy lawn on this particular park and it always when I ever I listen to this album, whenever I kind of think of the summertime and I think of uh, flute music. Um, but and like I said, it's not a contrived thing. It's not like me saying, oh, the weather's getting warm, the seasons are changing. Let me go pull out my acoustic discs or my classical discs. But I started noticing about, I don't know, in the last two weeks or so, started getting in the mood again to hear, um, to, to, you know, visit my, my kind of very random classical collection. And um, so I got just a, a bunch of things that, that kind of cover a little bit of ground here. Um, some of the things, it just totally random. Here's, the pro I think the first classical CD, I'm not going to get into my records, I really don't play them anymore, but here's one of the first, if not the first classical CD I ever bought. This, I bought probably about 1985 or so, and at the time, uh, when CDs were just coming out, there was really no such thing as a budget CD. This is amongst the first batch of budget CDs I ever saw. And um, they happened to be in a counter and a little display. And it was also the first um, like cardboard case I'd ever seen for a CD. Everything was the regular, uh, the regular cases, the jewel cases at that point, not even digipacks. They didn't exist yet. And I had never seen the, just a standard little cardboard envelope. And on the on the front counter of this record, this uh, actually it was a CD store. They didn't even they didn't even carry records in the mid '80s anymore. Um, they had this whole bunch of uh, cl very well known pieces, pl nothing avant garde, but um, apparently this was recorded digitally. So there's no information on the recording date, but it's a digital recording, so it must have been a new recording at the time. It's Handel's Water Music. So very, they were, these were all very mainstream pieces. But, uh, and you can't see the price on there, it was $3.69, which was unheard of when CDs first came out. And I couldn't grab it up fast enough. And the weird thing is, apparently it's not even an old recording. It's not even, you know, you would think that you would be getting something from the 50s or 60s, you know, just reissued on CD, but this was a, a digital recording. Um, not very long, it's 43 and a half minutes, so it's just got the Handel's water music on there, and that's it. Um, and uh, it's the Chicago Chamber Orchestra. So it's an American orchestra, but no recording date, no real information just who the conductor is, uh, no booklet or anything, just the CD. But, um, you know, the standard CD. Very interesting for, for uh, 
for uh, $3.69. This was a real bargain, real bargain. Um, I think for a lot of people that are not, and this is me, uh, not real knowledgeable about classical music, uh, they probably go. They probably initially uh, just buy a, you know a, a various various composers compilation thing, and um, since there's so many of them out there, I tend to <laughs> I have a very scientific method for for selecting these. Um, I I uh, I choose by the cover. If I'm not if I'm not looking for a specific piece or a specific composer or like a, a focus on a specific instrument. Um, and I just want kind of like a sampler classical overview of the you know more mainstream composers, the better known pieces, whatever. I'll pick something up. I have thought there's there's I don't know twenty some odd volumes of this Knife Music. Uh, I still have a glare issue here. Uh, Knife Music. This is Knife Music Seven, and I have five or six of these from the Knife Music collection. Uh, and it's uh, there, there's a few classical composers that whose name I can't even pronounce that I haven't heard of uh, Massonet, Torelli I've never heard of them but most of it it's a standard um, Bach, Beethoven, Dvorak, Vivaldi, Satie, Chopin, Tchaikovsky, Mozart, Handel, uh, Mendelssohn, and Grieg. And there's like two pieces here that are nine minutes long, so it's just really Excerpts. It's not full pieces. It's not the 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 whole classical composition with all the movements. It's usually just a, you know one movement or better known piece. Like I said there's two pieces. This is pretty typical of the series. There's two nine minute pieces on here: the Tchaikovsky, the Beethoven piece, a seven minute Dvorak. But there's a lot of six and four minute pieces on here, five minute pieces. Um, so it's just probably the better known sections. Of the various um, individual compositions, and it's not, which is not generally really the way I like to listen uh, to classical music. I mean, if somebody wrote a 25-minute piece, I want to hear the 25-minute piece, not necessarily a four-minute excerpt from it. Um, but you know, for for this kind of like thing, like I don't know what I want to listen to, and you know, let me let me get a little bit of uh, culture. You know, in my life of the of the better known classical composers, uh, there's Night Music Eight, and um, Bizet, who's somebody I'm not familiar with, Talman, which I've heard of but don't know a lot about, Schubert, Mozart, Debussy again, Brahms, Vivaldi, Beethoven, Handel, Dvorak, and Grieg. So again, there's a lot of people well known. Uh, there's an almost 12 minute piece on here by Schubert. A um, couple nine-minute pieces, and then again three, four, five-minute pieces. Um, but and generally, there might be there might be a, a, a couple, may, maybe more than two pieces that you've actually heard of on these, you know, that you've heard used somewhere before, probably uh, movies or something like that. So I've got you know this batch of these various artists, various pieces. Uh, kind of best of the classical music world, but um, you know, for the most part, I, I tend to either focus on a composer uh, where I have complete works um, or uh, an instrumental setting. So here's some more of the mainstream things, and these are and these are again like the like the things I already showed. Actually, pretty easy to get into. Uh, it's almost, I don't want to say classical music with training wheels, but there's not, you know, it, it's not dark, it's not difficult. Um, so I have this Ravel, uh, who is Complete Works for Orchestra Volume 1. I don't know if anybody that has classical, this is, you know, obviously the old thick duo box. Uh, these, this, this Vox box, there was a Vox record label, uh, I think it's gone now. Um, and they packaged together these things they called Vox boxes, which had two or three CDs in them. And um, actually, weirdly enough, the t the the company was listed, and, and even even back here in the uh, early '90s, as um, being owned by a company called Essex Entertainment, which was on a street not far from where I used to live. 
And so one day, in, it was in Hackensack, New Jersey, the town over from where I, I, I used to live. And so one day I'm like, I gotta, I'd love to work there. Let me find this. But I don't know there being any business there. And I drove back, and there's a very specific street address on here, which Vox is no longer affiliated with because I went online to check. And it was just a house, just a regular, an old house. Really weird. And it looked kind of like a boarding house now. So I don't know what the hell was going on there. Sure as hell didn't look like any kind of business. Very strange. Um, but these Vox boxes were, were these were really good um, ways to get into somebody. They were, one, very inexpensive. Um, two, they were generally, like I said, two or three CDs. Um, but they were repackagings, as you would imagine, of older recordings, you know, not necessarily really old but you know they weren't necessarily brand new recordings of these pieces and for instance this um, a lot of the CD sets would have three albums on them you know it used to be three uh, vinyl the equivalent of three vinyl albums you know three 40 45 minute albums or so and they were available at very reasonable prices and they were boy, what a buy they were for anybody that's you're not necessarily a vinyl junkie, but a music junkie and looking to get classical music is a great little introduction. And many or most of the ones I have came with this paper, a paper booklet on the composer. Not very, not very long, uh, maybe what, 11, 12, 12 pages counting the cover. And it's just regular paper, not even like a laminated thing. And I'm surprised this hasn't yellowed yet because I bought this around 90, 91, I think. Um, but I, I would expect it's, it's almost like a newspaper. But you know, for the price, you, you couldn't you couldn't beat them. And um, it was a lot of more of the mainstream um, composers. Here's another Vox box that I had to buy because the cover's so lovely. Uh, Say Sati, uh, you know, another guy that's easy to get into in the classical realm. Um, this is just piano music, just solo piano. And um, this is two 74-minute CDs, so there's three or four albums on here um, w worth of music. And I stuck the, and I kept the, the price tag stuck on the bottom of this. So you get this, you know, you've got the equivalent of three or four full albums on here, on two CDs. It was 9.98, and that was full retail price. I got this at Tower Records. Um, the Tower was not cheap; they were always pretty much charging full list price. Um, and that was fullest price, and I didn't even uh, didn't even blink, you know, at that price. Paper booklet. Again, I'm waiting for it to yellow any day now. This one's only got eight pages, counting the cover. But you know, there's you know a nice little um, just a written history of the composer, you know, and and it was kind of like the equivalent of I love these Vox boxes. Um, it was kind of like the equivalent of back in the LP days, having, you know, an LP with really good liner notes, which they, a lot, a lot of newer um, albums tended not to have that, but when they repackaged in the vinyl era, uh, older LPs, uh, you know, like the two furs, you know, uh, type of thing, they would generally include the historical background to the album, you know, because they'd be, you know, reissuing these albums that were 15 to 20 plus years old, going way back 30, 40 years sometimes. And they generally have in the gatefold, these big, especially in the jazz world, um, these big gatefold, I've got them sitting on the shelf right behind me as a matter of fact, these big gatefolds with, uh, you know, very small print with a lot of history on the albums that were in that package and the musician and where they were in their career and their life at that time. And this is kind of like the CD equivalent for that. So I love the Fox boxes for that reason. And continuing with the kind of mainstream things that I that I have that I you know easy to listen to, easy to love, uh, Debussy solo piano. A lot of people have the solo piano stuff by Debussy, and I've got quite a few of them. And then one time online, I found um, a CD for sa for for in the sale section, and it was Debussy's orchestral music, and I had only heard tons and tons and tons and tons of Debussy's um, solo piano stuff and his orchestra. I bought this one called Painting and Music uh, that's still been reissued with a different cover. 
about 62 minutes of various pieces, a lot of strings, you know, orchestra stuff. But it's just as pretty, just as easy to get into, not difficult again, as his piano music. Um, lovely, lovely pieces on here. I highly recommend it. And I don't know if this is a Russian recording or what, but, um, you know, again, at the time, well, this was a digital recording, so this definitely came in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and I bought it, you know, one, it was on sale, two, I had never heard Debussy's um, orchestral music before, I'd only heard solo piano, and I loved the cover, and, and for that reason, I... Um, I picked it up and I love it. This is in my favorites list of in terms of classical music. And then, um, you know, in my in my journey, you know, in any type of music I listen to, I'm always looking for the more avant-garde things or the things I don't know. I get more excited sometimes by a composer I've never heard of. Um, and so another thing that I bought because it was on sale and it looked interesting was a composer probably nobody knows, uh, Wilhelm Peterson Berger, 1867 to 1942. This is, um, apparently he's well known in whatever country he comes from. This is 1999 recording. Um, and, um, gee, I want to say uh, maybe Norwegian? Um, orchestral music, not difficult, not avant-garde. I'm surprised. I was kind of expecting it to be. Um, and, you know, this is more modern stuff. He, he passed away in 1942, and in the classical world, that's considered modern. Uh, but it's much pretty mainstream orchestral music that I like. I love that cover. Love that snowbound cover. Uh, I want to say he's a Norwegian composer that may be well known uh, in, in Norway. Um, though it's uh, definitely from overseas. But he's just one of those guys, I bought it, it was on sale, I'd never heard of him. I, I get excited when I have things like this that look interesting. Uh, I, was, I was expecting it to be much more avant-garde than it was. It's pretty mainstream stuff. Um, then, of course, if you're, if you're going to get into um, classical music, you know, and you don't want to just stick with the well-known things uh, or the real mainstream kind of quote-unquote pretty stuff, you know, you start jumping off a little bit more. Uh, Bartok, which I thought Bar Bartok seems to have a reputation of being kind of uh, avant-garde, but um, I don't recall hearing it on this recording so much. It sounds very mainstream to me. You know, again, orchestral music, music for strings, percussion, and Celesta, the keyboard. Um, and so that it seemed interesting because it had that, that keyboard aspect in there. Generally, when they talk about percussion in classical music, they're, they're not talking about drums. They're actually talking about tuned percussion, um, like uh, vibraphones and marimbas. Um, so that's what you get. It's not banging drums or anything. I was surprised at how mainstream this is. And this is also very, this is a London Decca, Decca Records, I think, yes, uh, Polygram from 1988. This was also a very, very early uh, buy for me. Of uh, I bought this as a new release. I actually bought this, I think, through the Columbia House Record Club. I was a member of the Columbia House Record Club, and instead of signing up for the um, jazz, you know, yeah, the jazz club, the rock club, the pop club, I actually signed up for the classical club because, um, I don't know, it struck me as more interesting than the jazz stuff was uh, pretty ordinary run-of-the-mill stuff so I decided to jump in feet first and sign up for the classical club instead so I didn't get the jazz catalog I would get the classical catalog every month and this is one of the ones that I bought it was a new release um, and it's like okay I'll try Bartok out so it was a very early um, CD classical buy for me uh, probably back in 88 89 and if you're jumping into classical music, here's here you know, and you're really dedicated to it, you definitely want to pick up some uh, Arnold Schoenberg. Now this is the, the 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 hard, the hardcore serious kind of flirting with the avant-garde. Um, I can't. When did he die? 19, 1951. This is very modern music. This is people really don't like this. You know, people with a 
a casual interest in classical music don't like it because it's it's kind of it's kind of dark and it can be very intense. Uh, I love it. This was a good um, this is a good buy. There's a whole big thick booklet in there. You can see the the CDs on top and this thick booklet with the gold on the bottom there is in there. A lot of a lot of history and information in there. It's it's heavy as hell. This there's only a single CD in here, and yet it's so heavy because of the booklet. Um, and this is yeah, almost 77 minutes worth of music. Pieces written in uh, 1899 to 1911. Um, various, there's some solo piano in here, most of it's orchestral stuff. This is, this is heavy, this is, this is heavy stuff, dark stuff. I gotta get more Schoenberg though, because I love it. And um, I, I guess this isn't really classical music, what I'm about to show, and I've spoken about it before. But um, I, in my mind, it is classical music, because it's some of the earliest music that we know of. Uh, music of the ancient Greeks. This is one of my favorite albums of all time, and I love this so much, and there's such a, a summertime, I don't, I don't like the summertime, but for some reason, the, the association I have with music in the summertime is a positive thing. You know, and I don't know how to explain that. Um, the po whatever the positive aspects of summertime, and I don't like the heat, and I don't like sweating and all that stuff, um, the association I have seasonally with summertime music is not a negative one just because I don't like summertime. It may, it may seem strange. Um, but, you know, when I, he when I hear this, I hear uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, on, you know, in the summertime, in a very still kind of hot night. And even though I don't like to live in it, I kind of like that imagery, if that makes sense. Just like you might like the image of, um, you know, this... this uh, a snowy plain, but you wouldn't want to be walking out in it because it's 10 degrees, you know. Um, so, you know, I consider this classical music. Maybe some people consider it uh, early music or maybe world music even, I'm not sure. But it's classical music to me. It's very it's simple. It's very easy to follow. Tons and tons and tons of atmosphere. And the other the other aspect that makes me buy classical albums is then uh, and I only bought a couple examples of this because this is running much longer than I thought it would be. Um, is when I get in the mood to hear certain instruments. You know, playing guitar, I obviously like to hear classical guitar. So, uh, you know, I bought some classical guitar, but instead of going with um, composers that I know, um, I, I pick up things, people that wrote specifically for the guitar, uh, composers that I don't know. Leo Brower. Who is still alive? Was born, well, I believe he's still alive. Born in 1939, so he's 20 years older than I am. Uh, is a guy who writes, wrote a lot of music, and this is just one volume. I have another volume of. Um, he wrote a, a lot of uh, music specifically for solo classical guitar, and it interested me because it was more recent modern stuff. It wasn't the same old classical guitar pieces recycled or a classical guitar version of, say, a Bach piece that wasn't written for guitar type of thing. I like, you know, the fact that it's a composer I don't know, so I don't know what to expect. I'm not going to know the pieces, but it's a new composer. I get to hear somebody with more modern ideas and somebody that wrote for the instrument. Um, same thing with a guy, and I bought this for two reasons. It's a classical guitar CD, but here's another composer that I didn't know. Manuel uh, Ponce, I think is how you pronounce it. A uh, composer I'd never heard of. Again, an album for just solo classical guitar. Um, no orchestra accompaniment, which I, I like as well, and I have others, but I also like the whole the whole solo thing and the, the space and quiet that you hear with a uh, solo classical guitar. Um, Ponce lived uh, 1882 to 1948, so this would still be considered modern. Um, even though there's 24 uh, preludes, which takes up most of the CD, which was written in 1929. Uh, there's there's another piece from 1930 and a uh, piece from 1948. Lots of, lots of atmosphere in here, uh, lots of technique. Um, and one of the one of the reasons I chose this one maybe over another 
classical guitar CD by an artist that I, a composer I didn't know, was I love the cover so much as well. It's one of those things. The cover just kind of brought me right into it. And another one I have is an album featuring flute pieces. Now this one is not by a single composer, but rather a whole bunch of composers. And the focus on this uh, is pieces uh, with the flute being the main instrument. But specifically, um, a lot of a lot of newer uh, modern pieces by compo again by composers I've never heard of, but not one composer, all different composers. Um, so there's there's actually there's not a I don't think there's a single composer I'd ever heard of on here. Now the flute's the lead instrument. There's a bunch of pieces that are just for flute and piano. Um, there are orchestral pieces on here as well. Um, so it covers quite uh, a wide range. And um, like I said, it's all composers I've never heard of before. Uh, I love the flute. Uh, it's probably just about my favorite uh, lead instrument to hear playing over an orchestra or even in any, really in anything, uh, in any field of music just about. Um, but the reason I bought this one, uh, I, this is the only exception, the only one here. I actually heard a track from this on the radio, a New York station, uh, classical station, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. I was driving in my car, and I, I don't even remember what piece it was. I heard one of the pieces, and I actually had to pull over to the side of the road uh, to listen to it and to, to write down the album. And I'm like, geez, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to find it because... They don't, you know, with, with classical, they, they might not list it under the artist's name, and because this is um, all different composers, I might not find it, but I found it. Um, and one more, and I remember the day I bought, this is one of those albums I remember I bought, and this is what I have been playing in the background to the extent that you can hear it, um, is again, uh, I, I bought, I remember buying this, again, a Saturday afternoon. Uh, we used to have Tower Records here. And at one point, Tower got so big that um, they took over a smaller building next door, and they called it the Tower Records Classical Annex, and it was just classical music in there, and that's all. Uh, and the main store, which was larger, had the rock, the pop, the, the video tapes back then, um, the New Age section, and the jazz section. But the classical was in its own separate building, right, right next door, so you wouldn't have to like move your car or anything. You could just walk next door. And I only, it didn't last long before they they moved the classical stuff back into the main store, uh, and and of course now the section was much smaller when they did. But this is the kind of thing I looked for: uh, virtuoso percussion music. Another one where the uh, instrument is the primary feature of the album. And it looked interesting to me because you don't, there's not a whole lot of classical music based around percussion, uh, you know, apart from the real modern guys like a Steve Reich or somebody like that. But this isn't, this isn't at all like Steve Reich. Um, and again, when they talk about percussion and classical music, they really uh, are not talking about drums. They're talking about tuned percussion, vibraphones, marimbas, that kind of thing. And this is an album full of various composers, and I never knew how to pronounce his name. Darius Milio, Milhoud? I don't know how you pronounce his name, who died, a very well-known modern composer who died in 1948. And there's a couple pieces of his uh, on here, as well as a Shostakovich piece. And the other composers on here are not people that are known by me uh, at all. I'd never heard of them. And... Um, but this was uh, these are fairly, these were fairly recent recordings at the time. They were new recordings, and um, various settings, mostly orchestral. But there's marimba and vibraphone at at front as the front main instrument. Um, really, really nice. Uh, yeah, vibraphone, marimba, sometimes together. Um, sometimes there's flute in there. Can't go wrong with flute. Uh, sometimes there's a whole orchestra. Really, really very interesting album. Um, I want to say pretty, and I, I, I guess you could say at times it is. It's not real dark and difficult, but it's something that you do want to pay attention to because 
there's such a wide a lot of it's very very quiet you're constantly turning the the volume up and then other times you know the orchestra an orchestra comes in and it's kind of loud and uh you know you might you know shock you a little bit so it's not the kind of thing that that really works as background music because there's too much dynamics in the music and there's a lot of sections that are very quiet this was uh, i remember you know this is one of those for some reason the whole thing looked interesting to me uh you know modern kind of percussion music in the classical mode and uh one of them I'm glad i have and it's you know lasted with me since I probably bought this in i want to say the late 80s maybe early early 90s so that's it this went on a lot longer once again than what i anticipated it would good thing i didn't grab more um so i thought i would do that for my seasonal kind of spring and uh you know i, I might you know as the summer really settles in if i start listening to um other things uh i might i might do a summertime video but this might be my primary listening for spring and summer in terms of uh a lot of things that i'm drawn to and uh once again you're listening to the vir virtuoso percussion music to the extent that you can hear it you probably can't hear it um right now there's a flute playing and the flute's not a percussion instrument so anyway with my new my new you know big budget um uh desk lamp in my garage at night uh signing off i'll be back i did do a terry riley part two, but i haven't put it up yet but it's done and um hope everybody's doing well i hope this had some value to it and um i'll be back very soon take care folks tune in next time for more tales from the garage <laughs>